Hello and welcome to Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we're doing early on Wednesday morning. Joining me from just down the street from where I am in New York City, Tim Bontemps, who's headed to Philadelphia on Wednesday to see the play-in game between the Miami Heat and the Philadelphia 76ers. Hello, Timothy. Hello, everybody. Join us from Dallas, Texas, where we're getting ready for the game one this weekend between, actually, it's going to be in LA, right? For game one, McMahon. That's correct. The, uh, Mavericks traveling out to see the Clippers for game one. And what could it be one of the great series of the first round? It's Van McMahon. Game one, round three of Mavs clips should be a fun one. Howdy, partners. Well, Good. round two of Kings Warriors is over. <laughs> uh, terrific performance. Just the uh, game just ended a few minutes ago with the uh, the Kings eliminating the Golden State Warriors by, um, I think it was 26 points, give or a take. Lot. Um, a one by 24 to make it official. Hmm. Where you're right. Um, a great performance overall by the Kings in this game on their home court. Got great shooting from Keegan Murray, made eight threes. Um, really good defense from Keon Ellis. They had a very aggressive game plan against Steph Curry. Um, Steph had a you know, not a great night. It wasn't terrible. He, tend to, he turned the ball over six times, but he turns the ball over. And what will be the headline probably is Clay Thompson going 0 of 10 and scoreless 0 of 6 in three-point range. A very much of a whimper for the Warriors who had did have high hopes coming into this game. They knew it was going to be a challenge going into Sacramento. Obviously, it's a hard place to play, although they won – uh, a couple of games in the playoffs there last year, including game seven. Um, you know, in listening to Steve Kerr and Steph Curry talk about where they thought the team was going into the week, um, I think that they had some optimism. Um, I know that everybody and their brother, especially at the network we work at, is going to have a tombstone out for RIP Warriors Dynasty. Um, yeah. Yeah. This was not a championship team. We know. We've known for some time it was not a championship team. Last year, they weren't a championship team. They didn't play like a championship team all year. Um, but I do think that this team did have some stuff going for it. They just played a very bad game and ran into opponent who played a very good game. And the consequence for messing around um, in – December and January, the consequence for Draymond Green missing 20 games this year for suspensions is, Bingo. That, you is that you don't get a margin for error. Yeah, and so this is, they, this is they, the finding out part tonight. That's, that's right. right. Well said. And look, so, they call yeah. him game six, Clay. Nobody's ever called him playing game, Clay. Well, well and, and, they won't, and they won't going forward either. There's going to be a lot of talk about Clay Thompson because he went over 10 in what could be his final game as a warrior. This night is Draymond Green's that. fault. And this season is Draymond Green's fault. If you want to say, why are the Warriors losing today? Some people think last season was Draymond Green's fault, by the well, way. Well, listen, this team has dealt with his nonsense for a long time. And has excused it over and over again, as we all know, for years. When he played this year, they were 33 and 22. When he didn't, they were 13 and 14. They went 10 and 11 in the 21 games he missed with the two suspensions and whatever they called the like return to play process after he came back. Um, if they win three of those games, they're not in the play-in. They're the fifth or sixth seed, might be higher. We're not even talking about them today. So this is why the idea of the Lakers sitting out the game today to get in a one-game scenario to get in the playoffs was insane because you could have a game where the other That's team gets hot. That's actually exactly what Darvin Ham said. He said whoever said that was in the asylum. Yeah, and he was correct, because if you get in one game where one team shoots the ball really well and your guys miss a ton of shots, I mean, Clay Thompson missed several wide-open shots. Like no, you got, hits, you got to get up for these playing games. Got to get well, up. I mean, listen, it you just, you're going to have a you, – you might have a bad game sometimes. And, like, if you put yourself in a one-game scenario where your whole season's on the line, this is what can happen. But this whole season for the Warriors comes down to Draymond Green and what he put the team through. And watching that game – they looked exhausted, and Steph Curry has looked exhausted for weeks. He has not shot the ball well for weeks. Yeah. He's still obviously a really good player, but watching him tonight, he looked gassed. 
And for all of Steph Curry's career, that's the one thing he's always been, is the most conditioned guy on the court. He's always flying around. He's always moving faster than everybody else. He never looks tired. And he looked exhausted. That's because he's in his mid-30s. And that's because I think he has had to shepherd this team through a whole ton of stuff while they have basically nobody else who can do anything with the ball. And so they obviously have some big existential questions to answer, but the reason that we're talking about them being done is because of everything Draymond Green has put him. Yeah, and, and still for his career, Draymond Green is on the right side of the pain in the ass to production ratio. But for sure. This year, you know, even last year, drastically on the wrong side. And, the, you know, the other thing is, as these guys have aged, they have lost the margin for error. So mm -hmm. before a lot of Draymond stuff, and, and the suspensions obviously weren't as long before, but before a, a lot of the chaos, you could overcome that because they were so damn good. And now they're just pretty good. And pretty good, plus a bunch of chaos, leads to messiness where you're having to scramble just to, uh, you know, I mean, for dude, it was... A few weeks left in the season, and and we weren't even certain they're going to be be a play in team. You know, the Rockets faded obviously, but th there was some question there. Um, I tell you what, though, man, this Clay thing is a bummer. I mean, if he fell out of his boat tonight, I'm not sure he could have hit the water. This huh. was rough, rough deal. And it, like you're sitting there watching in the fourth quarter, and it's you know, and, and I kept on waiting. Like they're going to really, they're, there's gonna, at least going to be a comeback mounted here right maybe not completed but at least there's gonna be some drama down the stretch right no and man he had a couple good looks in the fourth quarter just didn't go in and then i tell you who did really enjoy the night uh and it's a former warriors champion who absolutely loved this night old harrison barnes harrison barnes baby hitting this hitting uh three threes you know, those. this was not his last series with the Warriors. If he got a good, clean look at a three tonight, that thing was splashing. Uh, I, I guarantee you, you know, he, he is too diplomatic to say it. Yeah, he's a total class guy. I guarantee you that HB really enjoyed his role in potentially putting uh, a dagger in this dynasty. Game high plus 29 for Harrison Barnes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I don't know. I'm I'm not ready, and I I have to do a bunch of TV tomorrow, so I, I I'm not ready to. to oh, like, music. Here we go. Go on. I'm not ready to do this dynasty death of the dynasty thing. I'm just well. well like look, been, the, this it's been just, over. It's, it's been, been over for a while. You were the but one all year saying, "Well, hey, let's." I'm not going to put this team away. I'm not going to say well, this. I'm and not going to say that. And I wasn't that. wrong. They went 27 and 12. Well, no, you were wrong because they were not that good all year, which is fine. Well, like they're a fine okay. team. I mean, they're yeah. a fine team. They're not that like. But that's the thing. We both things it's, can be true. They're not a championship level team. Sure. And they're not awful. But it, fine. and and the question now is not, hey, you know, can the Warriors? Uh, come back and win a championship again with this core. Well, that will be the question that I'm asking. But, it, but the answer to that is no. So that's a pretty good no. conversation. The question is, will this core continue to be together? And obviously, specifically, will Clay Thompson be back uh, with the Warriors next season? And obviously, it would be at a significantly reduced salary. Also, I think it goes without stating that this does not exactly – uh, boost his value entering free agency. Not that people are going to need you too much to one game, but man. Uh, and, and so that that's the question. You know, it's been stated on the record by uh, the Light Years uh, check writer himself that they're going to try to duck under the luxury tax. That's slashing a whole bunch of salary. Um, you know, we can start with CP3's $30 million. By the way, I'm not sure what the future holds for CP3, but he was CP3 points tonight. Um, well, three more than tough. Clay. Well, <laughs> look, his career. I mean, I mean, we might have saw Chris Paul play his last game. I assume I he'll probably I play mean, next year. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. He could have. I, I don't know. I, I believe he would be. He will be somewhere. Um, getting way off track. San Antonio might be an interesting spot, but anyways, that's a. Discussion. Let me just say something real quick about Clay. 
Okay. We all agree he's not the guy he was four years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess he first had the injury in, in uh, 20. So, he, you know, he's not the same player. Okay, we all agree with that. But let me just say, he averaged 18. He played 77 games this year. Okay. Yeah. Yep. He averaged 18 points. He shot 39% on threes on nine a game. I, I know that that's not. No, he's a good player. That's, that, that's he's pretty good, damn good. He's he a good led, player. He led the league in free throw percentage. Now, for the first time in his career, by the way, he had stuff by like a thousandth of a point or whatever. Um, I know he's not what he was defensively, but this guy's not cooked. No, he would be a phenomenal addition for a good team on the mid-level. But obviously, well, look, even if he signs the same contract Grayson Allen just signed, if he's playing for 18 to 20 a year, he's a good NBA player. He's just mm -hmm. not a max player worth and, twice that. And he that's won't and, get the max and, from that's right. anybody. And and I think he'll stay right there because, yeah, that'd you be know, my piece. you say you, you got to cut salary and absolutely. So um, it's a non-guaranteed salary for Chris Paul. It's like, I think it's just under 31. Clay's making 43. If he comes down to eighteen to twenty, you're That's fifty knocking, million right there. You're not going to offer, yeah, twenty five ish. Like, I mean, that it doesn't take like you know. Oh my God, break it up into a thousand pieces. It's over. Um, the they are home, and at the end of the day, if you decided, if you were somebody who decided in January January twentieth that the Warriors were done, and you made a big declaration that they're over, I guess you can take a victory lap. Congrats. Um, like I said, for the last 39 games of the season, they went 27 and 12. I know it doesn't matter now, but 27 and 13 now, but yes. Oh, well, this well, game and again, count. and again, they wouldn't be in the play in if not for Draymond Green's nonsense, but I that's, understand, but, but that's saying, part of the whole, wanna, I understand. But if you want to look at this team and say, boy, what a pile of slop, then I, well, well, I can't help you. No, well, and even saying they're a Tennessee. Let's just get past that. Let's Even past. saying they're a 10 seed, like, look, they, you know, if they're in the East, they're th whatever. I got to look at the standings, but they're. Well, that doesn't matter because they're not in the East. Middle, they're, but I'm, I'm saying they're, they're, they're a pretty good team that yes. is ridiculously expensive. And, you know, that, that, that gets back to the Clay discussion. That gets back to, you know, CP3 does come back to Golden State. It sure as heck ain't for the 30.8 million in non guaranteed salary. That he has on the last year of his contract. But you know, Bobby Marsh just tweeted it. Golden State spent $382.5 million on this roster between salary and tax. $382.5 million to be a lottery team that is shipping your pick to Portland. Yeah, it's it's bad. Well, I agree. Yeah, I mean, look, that's that's the price of what they've done for a long time when they've had an incredible run. I would rather ship this forward to what does this team need to do outside of the clay question? And when you watch this team play, what they're crying out for is somebody else besides Steph Curry who can do stuff with the ball because their whole team is Steph Curry having to create everything on offense because they don't have anybody that's really a reliable player to score off the dribble outside of him. And that is a huge indictment on Andrew Wiggins, who we haven't talked oh, about at all, boy. who was terrible today, who has been terrible all season, averaged 13 points a game, shot 35% from three, has just not been good. And you want to go back to what has been the reason the Warriors overall, outside of the Draymond nonsense, have disappointed over the past 18 months? Andrew Wiggins hasn't been very good. And you He's go back to the finals in 22. Hey. Yeah, you go back to the finals in 22, he might have been the second best player on the court for the final few games of that series. And he has not been close to that guy since then. And this was the guy who... In his, you know, in his prime years, was supposed to look like he was emerging into the guy, but he thought he could be and would be the guy to help yeah. sort of be a bridge. And he's just been far short of that. And it it's really been uh it's really been apparent as this has played out. And by the way, tonight, we haven't even mentioned his name yet. Keegan Murray, playing the same position on the other side, had a monster game, hit mm -hmm. a ton of threes, was guarding Steph, playing great, huge moment for him. And you, that was the difference really in the game overall in the competitive portion. The Kings' third guy, Keegan Murray, was awesome. And nobody besides Steph could do anything for the Warriors. And I don't know what you do about Andrew Wiggins because clearly the title season is the outlier in his career. I mean, he was a disappointment. Three more years. 
85 ish million dollars left. Yeah. I, a lot of money. I don't know what you do about that. I mean, it, it, it's not, he is not positive or even like a neutral trade value right now. So well, they've got, they've got four players, four young players that are promising. Yep. And the two rookies, uh, Jackson Davis and Pajemski, uh, Moses Moody and Jonathan Kaminga. Those are four young players you can work with. Steph is still um, a high quality player. Clay is still a quality player. And when Draymond stays on the court, he's still a, a positive difference maker. So I don't foresee this team breaking into 100 pieces. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. Um, I don't see it. Um, I'm sure they will be looking at retrofitting some of the roster. I don't think there's a market for Wiggins to be traded. Um, uh, they've, you know, they've dipped their toe a little bit in trade talks. They obviously had some sort of flirtation with LeBron. Um, I don't think that'll be revisited, but they obviously, when it, we talked about the time when they, when they looked at that move, they obviously were kind of admitting that their team wasn't where they needed to be. And so I'm not sure if they go back to big game hunting, but, um, Remember, when if they're able to cut their payroll down, they will get access to normal trade rules again. They will get access to the exceptions. Like they potentially can get themselves in a position where they're a little bit more maneuverable with what they can do than when they're attack when they're a second apron team like they were. Well, you go year. back to you go back to last year. Like they had Dante Divincenzo on the team and couldn't keep him. You know who this team could really use Dante Divincenzo, a guy who has some juice with the yeah. ball who can can make plays defensively like that's the kind of guy on the perimeter they don't really have and it just you could see it in this game Steph just had so much uh so big of a load to carry a lot of the time he was out there Sacramento was just throwing two or three guys at him Keon Ellis had a great game but they could throw two or three guys at him because there was nobody else on the court they had to worry about guarding and like that's right. that's the thing they have to change with their well, roster look, Clay typically would make Two out of every five threes today. He made, but even but even besides that though, they need somebody else who can attack defense. No, I understand. Ball. That. And Jim, shots Jim, so he's got that. some. He has he's shown some glimpses. He has some potential there. He obviously, I think he's going to be. He's uh, a really good young player for sure. Player. You know, and look, they got way more than they could possibly have expected from the rookies this year, from a yeah. non lottery first rounder, and then Trace Jackson Davis like. It, tonight was a bit big for him, but the 57th overall pick being a, a nightly contributor, that doesn't happen. So solid starting center. Yeah. And that, and and that I way, he, I think he went nine and two in his, in the 11 starts that he made yeah. down the stretch. He's a solid player. They've, they've yeah. done, I mean, those are two good picks on like Dunleavy. They've done, they, they're not, this whole thing isn't hopeless. Like well, I agree with your premise on that. Look, there's nothing wrong or nothing to be ashamed if this group, Stay, and I'm talking about the core of the dynasty stays together and is competitive as they grow old, but not contenders. There's nothing totally. shameful about that. There's nothing wrong with that. It to me, there is uh, something to be said for you know three guys who are four time champions spending their whole career with one franchise. That has meaning. That has uh, certainly sentimental value. The only thing is, you can't be the most expensive team in the history of basketball and, you know, just be pretty good. So the the thing that's out of whack, the only thing that's really out of whack here, there was a couple things. The Draymond pain and the ass production ratio is out of whack this year. And then the, the, the payroll, um, you know, even if they're a team that got bounced in the first round, like their, their payroll is just, they were paying for past success. But that's over now because they're they're not going to be there anymore. Yeah, well, Steve Kerr is going through his post game press conference right now, and he said that he that the team desperately wants Clay Thompson back, that he's got good years left, and um, uh, he also said he wanted Chris Paul back, and he still thinks that that those guys can be part of a championship team. I mean, I don't know what he's supposed to mm-hmm. say, but I do think the the Clay part is a is a fair statement. Look, trying, it would suck if Clay Thompson is on yeah. another team. Like, yeah. I really hope as a basketball fan, like you said, McMahon, like, yeah, there's the whole Danny Ainge thing that they, the Celtics should have traded Larry Bird and those guys. But, like, 
mm-hmm. it would suck if any of those guys finish their career somewhere else. If they choose uh, to, it, it's their choice. That's fine. But it's like when you see a picture of Akeem Olajuwon in a Raptors jersey, like it just ain't right. Right. Or Patrick Ewing on the on the Sonics or any of that stuff. Like yeah. it, it just it wouldn't it wouldn't feel good if it goes that way. Yeah. Um, it was a. Uh, I will say this. It it was a real positive step for the Kings. They've had really kind of a a rocky last three weeks with the injuries and then yeah. losing their position. A tough loss that they had last Friday um, against the Suns, which actually put them in this play in game. And um, it was a good moment for them after what's been like, you know, just a step, sort of a set, step back season. And you know, De'Aaron Fox brought his uh, little kid kid out and had him in the, him or her, you know, just anyway, um, in the post game uh, interview and was really cute. And so it's a nice moment for them. And, and now they're going to get in a plane uh, tomorrow and fly to New Orleans because the Pelicans were victorious in the other play in game. On Pelicans Tuesday were night, losers and they were, they were. They did I say lost. victorious? He did. He did. No. They were victorious in getting a home game for the second play in game. This would be a good time for a windy sleep update. <laughs> yeah, um, they were they were defeated by the Los Angeles Lakers by four points. And while everybody is going to uh, throw the dirt on the Warriors and announce the end of the dynasty and whatever. The basketball tragedy that happened on Tuesday night happened in New Orleans, where Zion Williamson was having um, the game of his career. We have ripped him for yep. not rising to the occasion, which remains true. He had to sit around for two days and feel it again after an absolute egg that he and the Pelicans laid on Sunday to the Lakers. And Zion Williamson was dominating the fourth quarter of this game. The entire um, game. He kept the Pelicans yeah. in the game when Brandon Ingram had nothing and got benched in the fourth quarter. As did C.J. McCollum, who was awful. Yeah, C.J. McCollum, not to have ESPN on ESPN Prime here, but he stunk it up. And Zion was the only reason the Pelicans stayed even remotely within striking distance the whole game. Absolutely took over the fourth quarter, and he did everything he, we asked. He was dominating LeBron in the fourth quarter, and Anthony Davis, both of them. Yeah, yeah. He, they, they, he was going by Anthony Davis, who I voted third on my defensive player of the year ballot earlier today, and first team all defense. He was going by him like yeah. he wasn't there. Yeah, like and he was, in, was amazing. He was, in a, he was in attack mode all night. He was, and not just with the ball in his hands. You know, uh, uh, eleven rebounds. Um, I mean, he was. You know, everything we ask him to be dominate, take over games, be aggressive, you know, impact the games. And, and, you know, even when you don't have the ball in your hands, he did Mm -hmm. all that stuff until three minutes and change left, right after he attacked the basket to get to 40 points, and then gave that grimace and looked at the bench and said, "Uh, uh, I got to go. Second he landed, you knew he was leaving the game. He immediately stopped. He immediately put his head down. He immediately grimaced. It was it it sucked. And I was on I was on delay. I was catching up because I missed. The, I was a little delayed and couldn't watch live from the beginning. And I was like, "Holy cow! This is incredible! This guy is yeah. destroying!" I didn't know what the result of the game was going to be, but I was like, "Man, this is like I was getting excited watching." I was like, "Like you said, this was everything we've talked about wanting to see from this guy on the biggest stage, playing against LeBron." The same the crowd, team that dominated the crowd them. Crowd was going crazy. Crowd's it's, going crazy, and, uh, and Jose then it just Alvarado all went away. Was making all these tremendous plays, it was like, it was like you know exactly what they thought this team could be. Trey Murphy was reigning in threes, um, and you know they they were going to win the game, right? I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't go that maybe. far. It was a tie well, game. They LeBron, might have won the game. LeBron was 6 of 20 in this game. AD was 6 of 16. LeBron was looking, frankly, LeBron was looking old in this yes. game. He, he definitely, what was he, like 1 of 8 in the fourth quarter or something like that? He looked very tired. Yeah. Look, he oh. took on the assignment of guarding Zion Williamson the whole game for a second straight game. And he looked like he was taking taking a price for doing it. Well, he, he also no took legs. a charge on Zion. And as Took Big two charges. As as LeBron is like, dude. Well, I, I think one was on Zion. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> you, 
even if you're 6'9", 270 or whatever LeBron is, taking a charge on Zion, he felt that. Sure I mean, did. He felt it on impact, and he felt it on the fall. Um, and Zion was so by far the best player on the floor. Like, it was not even funny. And it's almost, it's like the story of his career. So much to get excited about. Uh, then he's got to leave the floor. It was, it was, it was, the, it was just a perfect microcosm of his career, which sucks because it looked like it was the moment he finally had arrived for 45 minutes. And then it all came crashing down. And I mean, we'll see if he plays on Friday. If you see a guy leave a game with a muscle injury, yeah, it's hard to assume he's going to play on Friday. I hate to always go back to uh, Luca on the superstar injury comps. <laughs> Yeah. And if I'm going to provide any hope, Luca left the game with hamstring tightness uh, against the Warriors recently, and he missed one game, and then he was back, and like like he never missed anything. Now, typically hamstrings aren't that kind, uh, and we all know Zion's history with him. So, well, he's had hamstring injuries before, and it pretty clearly looked like he knew exactly what he did mm -hmm. because he immediately pointed to it as Bon Temp said, called to leave the game and then immediately went to the locker room and was furious because yep. he knew exactly what had happened. He has a, he was a, whatever it was, it was a familiar feeling. And I think before he had his issues with his right leg, the, um, uh, the, the knee injury and the hamstring injury. And I think he had the quad or a calf injury. I think those are on his right leg. This is on his left leg. So, I mean, he um, really is. And, you know, he obviously had to play his way and diet his way into decent shape this year. Um, the difference. Yeah, he between, looked great. He yeah, looked the difference great. Between him now and him uh, at the end season tournament is striking. Yep. But it's, he is just such a freak of physics that staying healthy. I don't I don't know, man. Like bodies that big, there's we've never seen a, a body that big and that wide move with that sort of explosiveness. And unfortunately, Oops. I think it's just from a scientific standpoint, and I think I probably got a C or a D in physics at one point. So I'm certainly qualified to talk about this. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to uh to, to work from a health standpoint. Well, he also oh. jumps off two feet, which, you know, enables him to be extraordinarily explosive, but can increase your injury risk. Um, and the thing about it is, is that Brandon Ingram looked terrible in this game. Yeah. He was four of 12. And like you mentioned, he basically got benched. Mm -hmm. um, Not basically. He got benched. I mean, he, got he, didn't come he, did, he didn't even come back in with Zion left. No, and he didn't. I don't think he talked to reporters after the game. I think he dressed and bolted. Um, and CJ and CJ was awful. CJ was one and nine on threes. Um, I mean, yeah, they benched him for Jose Alvarado. He only came. Well, back Jose in. Alvarado was playing great. <laughs> well, I yeah. know, but he also shouldn't have been out there anyway. The second right. he came out there, the game immediately turned the other way. I mean, he was he was really bad. And look, those are their two highest paid players. Those guys are making a combined seventy million dollars, and they were awful. And like, yeah. if you're, you know, they, if, if Zion can't play on Friday, I think the Kings are going to win. And if they're, if the Kings don't win, it's those two guys are going to have to, or if the, the Pelicans are going to win, those two guys have to be way better if Zion can't play. Cause this team already struggles to score sometimes because they don't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of guys who are going to be explosive from the perimeter. Brandon Ingram is more of a mid range, tough shot guy than a guy who's going to light it up from three. So, like, CJ's got to have a good shooting game. Trey Murphy's got to get up a bunch of threes. Like, they're going to have to hit shots because, I mean, again, like you said, McMahon, the only reason they were in this game was because Zion was dragging them along, and then they had this lineup out there of guys who were just being ferocious on defense and making life difficult on the Lakers on the other end. Yeah, so and, and obviously Ingram's not right. Um Whatever happens Friday night, I do think there's there's clear questions about. It's always been a not a great fit, and they've kind of tried to make the most of it. You know, it, at some point, I think we're gonna have to, or uh, the Pelicans are gonna have to figure out 
do you want to continue kind of making the best of a weird fit or do you want to try to find a better fit? Well, it's going to come this summer, which we don't need to get too far ahead, but he's got one year left on his deal. So Mm -hmm. this is the, this is the time to have that discussion. Yeah. I mean, he didn't extend, they wanted to extend him last summer. He didn't extend because I think he was hoping that he could make all NBA and be super max eligible. Well, that obviously didn't happen. So, um, We'll see. I mean, they do need to extend him. He is a, an important player for them. So, or trade him. But this, yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, I, but this is the stress max. This is a classic case of the stress max. Um, he, he's not a max player. Well, well that, and that's, and that's is, the whole, this is why that's it's the whole problem. This is one well, of the reasons why it's stressful. Because a guy who's a 25% max player isn't always a 30% max player, 30% of the cap max player, five years later. You know? Um, and very rarely do you see contracts negotiated that are, you know, where, you know, where guys, you know, gets 90% of the max, you know, mm-hmm. most of the time, if they're close, they get it, especially if you're worried about being a small market, like they are. And, you know, that's, he's headed for a classic stress max zone and with the rules and the fact that the Pelicans have never paid the tax ever. And that they owe Zion this money, and you know Trey Murphy is lined up to get an extension yep. this summer, and they owe um, CJ this money. I mean that extension is not looking great, and so they can't just you know it's it's just it's hard to just give it to them. So it's a stress, it's a classic stress max situation. And, uh, and by the way, real quick, because we it's sort of been forgotten, the egg on Sunday obviously is they're oh, yeah. they're paying the price for it now, right? If oh. they show up and get that one on Sunday, and Zion plays the way he did today, and they win that game, obviously not playing this game, right? And like that, if they end up losing Friday, and they they fall out of the playoffs after coming close to winning 50 games and everything we talked about, Zion actually having a healthy season, all that stuff, man, that that is going to be one long summer in New Orleans. I, will, I do want to mention uh, D'Angelo Russell, who – was tremendous in this game for the Lakers, um, made five out of 11 threes, had a huge three-pointer from the corner in the final minute of the game that pushed it from a one-point to a four-point lead and gave the Lakers the leverage down the stretch when it became a free-throw game. He was enormous in a spot where the Lakers needed him, and he gets maligned at times and fairly at times. Um He's had a great second half of the season, and he, you know, when I do mean great for his oh, yeah. standards, and he had an excellent performance in this one on the road under pressure on a night when LeBron was worn down and where AD, you know, AD made an, had an impactful game, but was not great. He was six of 16. Um, he, uh, you know, had that back injury on the, on the uh, foul from Larry Nance the other game. Other night, he was questionable coming in. Obviously, he was going to play. It was a, a play-in game. Um, that was remain incredible. His shot is just gone. And I voted him 13 on NBA. He's had a great year. But it, like, anytime he yeah. takes a jumper, I just, I always expect him to miss at this point. And, like, he didn't he used to be a decent, even mid-range jump shooter. And, like, yeah, it's just totally so he, abandoned he, him at this point. He was on my all-NBA team and my all-defensive team as well. Um he did have 15 rebounds, and he had a huge offensive rebound yeah. uh, on a LeBron, late. a very weak yep. LeBron miss late, and then he got fouled on the play, and then he stepped up and made both free throws. Mm-hmm. So, um, The Lakers have to be, you know, they're, they're going to be significant underdogs to Denver. I don't know if ESPN, <laughs> do think? If ESPN bet put it out there. Not, yeah. not, not at our employer, I'm sure. <laughs> not at our employer. Well... I got into it with uh, Shannon Sharp and Stephen A. today about. Oh, I saw, I saw that the Lakers. Uh, I mean, you're going to regret those words. Yeah, I mean, he said that the Thunder were the weakest number one. I don't know what he said. The yes, weakest I, number I, one. I, yes, I'm. Again, I'm. I'm just. I'm just playing. I know. Yeah, I mean, that was a that was a layup. <laughs> I mean, even if even if uh, the, the the Thunder get upset, I'm not. You know, they are not a week's uh, number one seed. Well, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow you'll get to hear the games. case for how the Lakers are, or today, you'll get to hear the case for how the Lakers are going to win and shock the world against Denver. So, there you oh. go. Well, he also or said... win an A game? He also said that the Nuggets lost the game to the Spurs last Friday on purpose. Oh, yeah, certainly. That's why Joker and Jamal Murray played a ton of minutes in that game. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. I Makes well whatever. Sense. Anyway. Um <laughs> listen, they got in though. They did get in. And look, I will say this. If you are the Lakers to me, I mean, set aside all this nonsense about you should tank out or whatever. I do think the best chance for the Lakers to beat Denver, if they're going to, I don't think they're going to win the series, to be clear. But you saw how tired LeBron looked today. Absolutely. Their best chance to beat the best team is if they can summon it right now and play them. And LeBron has the energy to get through it. Now, again, I do, I'm do. i picking Denver to win the series. I don't think it's going to be that competitive. And how many games? I want to say four, but I'll probably say five because they'll probably Denver will probably give one away in L.A. But but I do think if you're the Lakers and you're going to have to play them at some point, I'd rather play them now than in six weeks because I don't think they'll have the energy to beat them in six weeks. The other sure. thing is the number one thing with the Lakers is the health of AD and LeBron. Yeah. And the first round, you're going to have more rest in there. <laughs> yeah, it's the longest one. Conference finals every other day. Yeah, I'm not saying that like, oh, they got a great shot. Like, I, I it's going to be uphill. It's going to be a super uphill battle. But you know, I, I like, I, I like their position in the first round better than I like it in the conference finals. And my, my point is, it, if you're the Lakers and you're trying to win the whole thing, you know, this is not the Magic. This is not the Cavs trying to win a playoff series for the first time in decade plus. Oh, They're that's not enough to... for the Cavs, Dom. Don't oh, the, Cav, the Cavs clear. trying to win a playoff series the first time in a decade plus. We just we're just a LeBron, uh, without LeBron, LeBron erasure. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, without LeBron, I, I I've said it. So Got to say, times. certain guy might have had something to do with. Some I know I've said it. I've said it so many times that it it it's, it falls in my head. But they haven't won a series without LeBron since the '90s, so their reality and what they're achieving is different from the Lakers, you know? So, and the same with Orlando. Orlando hasn't won a playoff series since Dwight Howard. So, like, that's not the same. So, so the Lakers, if they're going to do anything, they got to be Denver, whether you survive for a month longer or not. I know that makes you feel better, and it may make for higher ratings in the interim, but you know, it doesn't really change the reality. Yeah, it's helps our 401k, but that's about it. Listen, <laughs> it goes back to the discussion we had the other day. I just, I don't, I, the idea that it's like better to win a round, like the goal is to win the whole thing. Like that's the goal. The goal isn't well, to like yeah. win a round and then, Hey, we have a parade because we won a round. Like it's not, that's not the point. Yeah. There are places where they might. Let's be I'm honest. not saying, I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate winning a oh, round in the playoffs. Hey, if Minnesota wins a round, I mean, they had a play in title parade. They might have a, a, a Listen, first round party. <laughs> Yes, but Minnesota. The the Lakers left Minnesota a long, long time ago. Yes, talking I, about the Lakers here. Yes, I am not. I am playoffs victory. Playoff series victories should be celebrated because they are hard to do. I, I'm not saying that, but it's also not the end goal here. And like setting your whole season up to then win a playoff series, it's not certainly not what LeBron's trying to do. Approaching year uh, his 40th birthday, he's not yeah, worried about I mean, winning a first round series. If, if the Wolves have a first round victory party, do uh do A Rod and, and his old pal <laughs> have to pick up thirty six percent of the check? They have to pick up thirty six percent of the check, but they have to watch it from the stands. They're not going to be allowed to <laughs> right. take part in it. They'll have it in their the they'll have it in their fancy room, but they're not allowed in anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, anyway, uh, speaking of um, teams with high expectations, I want to talk about the Bucks for a couple minutes here. So Woj reported Bucks. on Tuesday that um, Giannis is not going to be ready to start the playoff series, which begins on Saturday um, uh, against the Pacers. Now, it was Tuesday morning when Woj reported this. Three days away from the game. Um, and they already know that he's not going to be ready. <laughs> you know, typically... In a situation with the star player, you're like, you know, round the clock treatment. You know, let's see how he feels on Thursday. Let's see we see if he can do anything in practice on Friday. Maybe he can like go test it out on Saturday pregame. No, whatever they were seeing, they're like, no chance. And so that is definitely worrisome. And Oof. look. We'll get the schedule soon, and we'll see if there's a couple of days in between some of those games. You know, sometimes in the first round, you can play just two games over the course of like five or six days. Um, but like, 
the Bucks are oh, up I got against some, it now. I got, some, I got some breaking news here for you, fellas. I'm looking at the West schedule. You got an East one? We got we got all the games. So oh, okay. the Milwaukee Bucks play Sunday, Tuesday, then Friday and Sunday. Oh. That's the first four games of their series. I probably won't get to watch any of those because it'll be the exact same days as Madison. Clips Lined up. up with you. Yeah. Um, well, Sunday, Tuesday isn't I thought they started Saturday, but Sunday, Tuesday isn't great. So they already know he's out Sunday. Yeah. And I don't know. Sunday, Tuesday is not does I don't like I don't like the chance well, listen, of Tuesday. To me, the biggest injury question in this series is not Giannis. Obviously, the Giannis thing is critical, but it's can Tyrese Halliburton by Sunday look more like the guy he was before he got hurt than the guy he's been in the last couple months? Because if they can, if that if this time off allows him to get some of the burst back and he looks like that guy again, I think the Bucs might lose this series whether Giannis is healthy or not because of how well the Pacers match up with them and the fact that the Bucs are probably going to have to win track meets and the Pacers are better at track meets. Well, so and- part of why that series went the way it did in the regular season. And Dame has been banged up and not playing well for a little while here. Yep. You know, I mean. I mean, they tried, like we talked about the other day, they tried to win the game Sunday against Orlando, and they couldn't do it. I know Giannis wasn't playing, but they were trying to win that game. Everybody saw the final score and thought they just tanked it. They weren't tanking it. They got smoked. Dame played 30 minutes, was 2 of 14 from the floor. I mean, they couldn't get anywhere. Last five games, Dame is shooting 28% on threes. Small yeah. sample size, but not exactly coming into the postseason well, on a high. Now, the nice high. thing is you are playing the, the the NBA version of a ball rack at times in the Indiana Pacers defense, and that could although, maybe get him going a little bit. Although the Pacers defense, I'm not saying they're you know suddenly stoppers or anything, but since the Siakam trade, it is a significantly better defense. Now, significantly better than historically horrible. But they, they have not been a terrible defensive team since they traded for Siakam. Yeah. Um, uh, it was it was surprising news on 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 the Giannis front there. And um, I don't know what to say because because if the Bucks lose in the first round, Bontemps, you have articulated that they are under. I I agree with you. I think they're under the most pressure of any team in this postseason. Um, and then the Clippers are up there. I think the Suns are up there, but I think the Bucks are at the front of the line. The Bucks, the Bucks are number one. They fired the Bucks fired their coach at thirty and thirteen, and they yeah. traded away Drew Holiday last summer, last <laughs> fall, to get Damian Lillard. They fired Mike Budenholzer after losing in the first round. They they are the number one pressure team. They did so all they, that stuff to win a championship. They so fired their coach at 30 and 13 and are sub 500 since then. Yes. Yes. And they were 19th in defense when he got fired and they're 15th since. It's, I mean, it's, it, the, the move hasn't worked. Well, and, and look, it really, the, the big picture thing here is they have bent over backwards and burned all their assets to try to please Giannis. And there's not much to be happy about right now. No, and there's, so, there's not a lot left to do. I mean, so this the, is what they've got. The unanswerable question is if they go out in the first round with Giannis missing a big chunk of it with injury, what does that mean? And I'm not, I'm not expecting you to give an answer right now. Yeah. But, you know, well, like, to me, personally, it doesn't matter. Because, again, if you look at the 82 games, this team isn't good enough. Like it's it's sort of the same discussion we had about the Warriors earlier. They're obviously a little bit better version of it because Giannis is still a top five player in the league at this point. I mean, he's the first player ever to average 30 a game and shoot 60% from the field. He obviously had an incredible season, but this team isn't good enough. I mean, they're well, they're they're not, they're just not. Like they their defense is not good enough. They might be able to talent their way through if Giannis gets healthy, but they're they have too many significant flaws. And they don't have obvious ways to fix them. Like it, it's it's not. It just doesn't look great. Well, one thing they have going for them is there's no such thing as failure. Get down <laughs> from the first round, it's just a step towards success. Uh, well, maybe we'll have a reprisal. We'll see. 
but that that series is going to be interesting. And this time off for Tyrese Halliburton, I, that that game one, I'm going to be really curious to see if he looks like he's got some pop. Because if he does, and they're flying around, it's a it's a tricky matchup for Milwaukee. Well, I I, I agree with McMahon. I think how Dame looks and feels is big. And if he goes yeah. into that series and says, "Okay, I just." I, I, I got to start putting up 40 point games because they're just going to need points because you know, they're not going to be able to defend and you know that they're going to get attacked and transition. You know, this, it's not like this guy's five years removed from playoff greatness. The guy can still do it. And, and, seen and, and maybe the several days off here is what he needs to get back to being, you know, the guy that we've seen for years, but yeah, we haven't seen him for weeks. Well, and I think the key, I mean, we're talking a lot about a series that starts Sunday, but the key to that series to me, one, maybe the main one, especially if Giannis is banged up, is Aaron Neesmith versus Chris Middleton. Because if Aaron Neesmith, who has had a really nice revival of his career since getting traded to Indiana, if he can lock up Chris Middleton and not let him get going, there's not a lot else on that Milwaukee offense besides Dame going off at that point. Like they, they now they really need Middleton to get going. And if, if Neesmith can, keep him throttled down that that that's sort of a smaller thing to watch in that series too. All right. Before we go, Bon Thompson, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, playing the game, game tonight that, that you're going to face tonight. Yes. yes tonight. Um, where we're going to, you know, Embiid is listed on the injury report is questionable, but expecting him to play. All signs um, point to him playing unless there's some setback between now and tip. Uh, the Sixers are, not a seven seed when they've had him beat this year. I don't know exactly to have their record right in front of me, but they are 31 and eight. When okay. he plays. That's pretty good. So pretty that good. is, that is not a seven seed. Um, On pace to have a, a better record than the Celtics. Oh, wow. Now that's a good number. I'm going to steal that for TV 65, tomorrow. 65 gonna, win pace. Let me write that down. I'm going to steal that for TV tomorrow. Like I steal all, all your stuff. That's true. Um, you do. So, um, okay, because Bontem steals it from other sources. <laughs> yeah, Stat, <laughs> we'll we'll steal from Stats Williams if you want the honest opinion. Um, uh, I, I'm fascinated to see what the Heat bring in this game because we know their history, and I'm fascinated if we get a Celtic or a, a 76ers uh, Knicks series, potentially could be super interesting series. Um, to me, I know there's so much focus on the West because everybody wants to, you know, you know, bury the Warriors and do whatever to the Lakers. But this, to me, is the is the crown jewel to play in uh, this week in this game. And so, Bontemps, what are you gearing up for in that one? Well, look, I mean, this game either a team's going to have a chance to make the East Finals or a team's going home in the next two weeks, right? Like if you if you lose this game on Wednesday. Sure, whoever wins Friday is going to think they have a chance to beat Boston. It's going to take something miraculous to beat the Celtics over seven games for anybody in the East. Like, they've just been clearly better than everybody else. And But if you win this game, you get into this other side of the bracket. We just spent all this time talking about Milwaukee and Indiana. Neither one of them are terrifying. The Knicks have had a fantastic season. I'm not saying whoever wins this game, especially if it's Philly, is going to walk all over the Knicks. But... There, Julius Randle isn't playing. Philly will go into that series as it's probably a toss-up series. If they win that series, they're going to be favored to make the conference finals. So it is a massive, massive game. You've obviously got Joel Embiid's playoff history. He's healthy now. He's averaged. I mean, I know he had the, the little bit of a knee thing on Friday, but in five games, the guy's averaged 39-5 and five since coming back from this knee thing and missing two months. It's not quite the 35 points a game he was doing before that, but he's looked damn good. And if they can win this game, get a couple more days off going into Saturday, they got a chance to do something here. And then for Miami, we've hinted at it a little bit, but look, Jimmy Butler's got one guaranteed year left on his contract. This is a team that's been in the lower half of the bracket for the last five years. Yes, they've had three runs to the conference finals and beyond, but They've got some decisions coming this summer on what's going to happen there. And I think a lot of it's going to be dictated by what happens over the next few weeks. And, you know, it's easy to forget, and we've talked about it before, the Heat were a couple minutes away from not even making it to the playoffs last year. And it was that close against Chicago. 
to being done. So maybe they're going to summon it tomorrow and Jimmy Butler is going to summon it and they'll win this game. And again, Miami playing the Knicks would be a fascinating series, be super fun to watch. But these guys had three games on their racket, the Dallas game, the Indiana game, the Philly game. They win any of those games, they're the five seed in the East. Instead, they're the eight seed and Jimmy Butler did not get it done down the stretch in any of those games. So massive stakes on both sides. And if Joel Embiid is going tomorrow, to me, Philly's clearly the better team. They should come out on top at home and win the game. Yeah. All right. Ready to well, talk Hawks Bulls? Nope. Kobe White, I had him second on uh, most. We will talk about the winner of Hawks Bulls. By the way. On Friday. Most improved ballot. I had to fill out our ballots today. Most improved ballot. There were some guys on there that had played over 65 games that I couldn't vote for. Oh, yeah. The, the, the NBA's got to fix that. That's not the spirit of the freaking rule. Dante DiVincenzo played 81 games. He played 2,300 I minutes. I don't care how many he... minutes to qualify yeah, for they, the rule. They, So did got... Isaiah Hartenstein. Tibbs needs to play his guys more minutes. That's the lesson. <laughs> yeah, here. right. I mean, Tibbs is on, not dude. playing guys enough minutes. Like, Shame Kamina on you, played Tibbs. 74 games just because Steve Kerr y- yanked him early when he should have been playing more. He's not eligible. Come on. The NBA has got to fix that. That, that That's honestly. No, seriously, fair. Kuminga, I thought I was having a brain fart. I was like, because I was going to put Kaminga third on the, on the line. <laughs> You're like, hold on, that's how he spells it, right? I'm like, why <laughs> can't I find Kaminga in here? And I went and looked at his stats, and it said he played 74 games. And I'm like, yeah, why no, is that, he here? That's a complete embarrassment. That's a that is not what that rule is supposed to protect against. Like, I'm sorry, if a guy plays 67 games and a couple of them, that's one thing. If he's playing 74, 81, we don't need to worry about how many minutes he played in each game. That's well. Ridiculous. Like, like, the rule is a dumb rule. If you're going to have the rule, have it for MVP and have it for first team All NBA, and don't have it for anything else. Like, what are we doing? Like, it's it's a ridiculous rule in the first place. But those are the only things it should be for. The fact that it's for most improved player is insane. Yeah, well, like um, I, I don't think he was going to make the team, but like the the Trailblazers organized an entire um, campaign for Matisse Thybul for all defense. Sort and of then, sums up the Portland Trailblazers season. I thought that's true. And then realized he wasn't eligible, even though he'd played over 65 games because he had, you know, not enough minutes. So even the teams are coming to yeah. understand the way this rule is portrayed. So you guys stick with your straw poll MVP ballots. I did. I did. I had, I mean, I didn't vote in. The oh, I didn't. Itself, I put but... uh, Brunson fifth instead of Sabonis. Uh, Jalen Brunson was fifth on my MVP ballot. He was fifth on mine. Mine was Nicole Jokic. Uh, Luka Doncic, Shea, Giannis, and Jalen Brunson, which was also my first All NBA team. Yes, uh, I had a I had Luka third and uh, Shea second, um, but that was also my first team All NBA. Um, you can still so, eat at Nick and Sam's with me. I think. What's that? I said you can still eat at Nick and Sam's when you come to town with me. Well, I, you know, like you just can't get the Luka, the seventy-seven ounce steak. You're not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, I'm, you know, if there was a, if there was someone who's going to make a late push, it would be the fact that, you know, the Thunder and Shea won the number one seat. Oh, you I know. was in Oklahoma city. Trust me. I've heard all about it. Yeah. I know you have. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, also the ballots arrived at 2 AM and we had till six to file it. I was like, Whoa, 6 PM. 6 PM. Sorry. Ooh. Yeah, 6 p.m. I, really interrupting the windy sleep update. Well, the the, uh, the ballots had to wait to be uh, delivered. Usually, it used to be they would come out before the season ended and you would have them be filed by the end of the day Monday, uh, usually by midnight, I think. And uh, they got sent out later because the NBA had to wait and make sure there were no challenges or no challenges were uh, to the rule uh, were all taken care of, I think, in time uh before they actually said, here's the official ballot. So that was what this. led to the it, delay. It is kind of interesting, though. It, I, We'll see if it makes any... Comparing it to the straw poll will be interesting because in previous years, people would start voting before the actual end of the season. And um, I don't think very many people did that. I well, think the vast majority of people, I think, voted 
Yes, but on the last day of the year, the, the Thunder secured the number one seed. So it's possible that Shea may have picked up some votes. I know that there well, was also a, those probably MVP billboards came out after the straw poll. So that's right. Cuban tweeted a lot. So yeah. You know. I'll be curious to see if Luca gets if Luca or Shea gets second. I think that's where the drama will be. Yeah. Yeah. I would um, all all very deserving, but only one can win. Yeah. Also uh, we'll talk about that when I start getting announced. Okay. Thank you for uh, listening and watching the Hoop Collective podcast. Thank you to McMahon and Bontemps. Thank you to Jackson, our producer. And we will be talking to you later this week. Adios, amigos.